this is my first vlog. It's something which is going to serve my desperate need to tell stories, which I've always had since I was a kid. Even though I think about it every day and I always have something to say, I never actually really get round to doing it, except once in a blue moon, when there's something really... Like the time that we had extreme weather conditions on the island, two years in a row, and the entire place was flooded and I had like this much water inside my bungalow. What are you gonna do? Where are you gonna go? Where are you gonna go? Or the time that I was swimming and I got caught by a really big wave and my GoPro camera was on my head and it came off and it decided to go swimming by itself and it filmed a crazy psychedelic journey of underwater exploration. Or the thousands and thousands of hours of... Okay, I'm exaggerating. Hundreds of hours of video footage of my daughter from this big... You have to put your chin on, that's it. There you go. Oh, Vang Vieng in 2010, the most hedonistic place on the planet Earth. <laughs> or that redonkulous trip to New York in 2008. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of stuff going on right now. Drone. <laughs> Honestly, you've got to see this stuff. You've got to see this stuff. And this is where I'm starting. This is going to be the first one uh, that I'm going to do today. It's a retrospective. So this short film is about my granddad, Ken. I went to meet up with him one day and I set up a couple of cameras and recorded him telling these stories. I didn't really have a purpose for doing it other than I just wanted to. I hope you enjoy this video about my granddad. Standing on end. We're talking cross purposes all the time. Mike, we have to have kids. You send your kids down here and I'll look after them for you once they start to walk. Your mum and dad met because Louise had a friend and they were going to exercise his gym. Your father and his mate were there at the same time. At the gym? At the gym. My dad at the gym? Yes. Bloody hell. We used to cruise at a hundred, didn't we? Always. Tell us what it's like then living with Ken. Don't talk daft. <laughs> yeah, but he's not with it. us. He's not even looking where he's going. His mind's thinking on something else. That's a picture of painting. The, the gig slowed down as the war started, but there were still gigs knocking about until I joined up. And I was working down at South End from the Crystal Palace. I used to go daily down there. Well, we lived in Thought B. It wasn't South End. South End's mm. common. <laughs> yeah. The question came up about whether you should get married. We actually got married there. That was 63. That means you've been married for 40 years. Which anniversary I don't is that? even want to think about it. Do you know when he's driving, his mind is miles away and he's driving and his foot's going on exaggerated faster and faster. And I say to him, do that to him. Slow down. Oh, Susie does and that he to says, me. What? As the war was coming along, we all knew there was going to be a war. I thought, well, what am I going to do? And I thought about it for some while. And I thought, I want to be a pilot. Don't ask me why, I just wanted to be a pilot. I joined um, a flying club, government sponsored, and you could fly for an hour for a pound only if you joined the club, which I did. So I, I did one lesson and the war was on us. So the day war broke out, I went along to the Labour Exchange where you signed on and I said to the bloke, I want to be a pilot. And the chap asked me lots of questions, daft questions about what newspaper do you read and all that sort of jazz, you know. What school did you go to? What qualifications did you get? And all the rest of it. And so they said, well, you can go home and we'll let you know what the result is. So I went and joined up and they sent me down to uh, be a pilot and I arrived at Torquay, climbed off the lorry, that's the RF method of transport, suddenly I'm posted. I'm sent up to a place near west of London, there was a little grass field there, 
with some Tiger Moth aircraft knocking about. And lots of them up in the air, sort of all doing exercise and the rest of it. I thought, oh, I should be in there tomorrow. I was shivering like a leaf, wondering what this was going to be like. The bloke announced himself as the instructor. And he said, well, he said, you won't be doing any flying today. He said, it's just general uh, pickup. I thought, thank Christ for that. <laughs> anyway, that was my first day. He was a big musical influence on me. This is an 86 year old guy talking about the war. So it's probably not going to be the most spectacular. It's about 15 minutes long, which let's be honest, is an eternity of time on the internet. People don't like to spend too long. Keep it moving without it getting too boring. After all, this is a film which I've basically made for my family. It's not really, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'd be really, really happy if anybody else watches it, but it's the only video of Ken in existence. And what a beautiful little piece of history. I really hope that you enjoy watching it. We had a flat in London. I was going to buy a house in, in Southampton, which I did later on. But I had to make this journey every time I went flying. And I got in that Dame Le Dart. We were at the Crystal Palace, we had to go across the Thames. On this particular occasion, I was drinking till they practically closed, and then somebody in the mob said, uh, I'll race you up to the Flare Path, or whatever the name of the place was, I can't remember. It was a, no, the other club that was about four miles up the road north of South End Airport. So I said, Right, I'll, take, I'll give you a start. <laughs> there weren't any drink driving laws. There weren't any speed limits. There were police and there were police cars, but it was more a kind of a friendly, gentlemanly, you know, give you a tap on the shoulder and g guide you home kind of law enforcement situation. So I went up there like mad, overtook them all. And I went round in the dark on a very narrow winding road and I ended up in a field. So I backed out of the field <laughs> and uh, continued. And I still got to this place first because it was the last one that was going to buy the drinks, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I was drinking there till all oh, late, till about three in the morning. And suddenly the phone, phone went and Nina was on the phone. She said, are you coming back tonight? So I said, oh yes, I will do. I drove out of there and down towards the airport I went on to the pub. I suddenly felt very tired. So I drove in the lay-by and fell asleep. Suddenly I'm awakened and uh, I look out, there's two blooming great big policemen standing by the side of me with their Daimler dart. Are you all right, sir? Do you mind getting out of your car? <laughs> so I got out of my car. So I said to him, I'm not drunk, you know. He said, no, we know you're not, otherwise you wouldn't be standing there. Uh, How do you like your car? I said, all right, thanks. How do you like yours? <laughs> so he said, if I were you, I'd drive up the road there and pull off and have a sleep somewhere. I thought, bloody hell, that's just what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> I went out the road like a scalded cat with the car slithering from side to side. So Ken was very meticulous and everything was very carefully planned and thought out, but he was also a complete maniac in the style of a 1930s Formula One racing driver. Every single bend that he would travel on every day had a speed rating, so if it was an 80 mile per hour bend or a 90 mile per hour bend, he would always go at that speed through that bend. I do remember one occasion, we went through the tunnel, it was in the middle of the night, and it was deserted, with the exception of two workmen on a ladder halfway down and as I approached it from about uh, 200 yards away I could see that they they saw me they looked at the, and they ran down the ladder and pulled the ladder in and put it on the pavement <laughs> and I went down through there through that ladder about 120 and a police car had drawn up on the outside I thought oh Craig I'm in trouble now and they had a dame le dart these police looked at me I looked at them and all they said was, how do you like it? <laughs> I said, not bad. And I was off again at a fantastic breakneck speed. 
So basically the story is this, I used to make films, I stopped making films, and now I kind of want to make films again. I have an archive of bits and pieces and all kinds of stuff, and I haven't really done anything with any of it. So uh, that's the idea. Check out my YouTube channel for archive footage. But don't subscribe yet, do it at the end. We've got another five minutes left of this film. Ken was also a musician. I had a long musical career, actually. I started when I was... Um, about 14, and I bought a clarinet that cost me about a pound. I used to go and sit under the tree and play tunes to myself. We formed a band, some fellas at school. We didn't get paid, we got a cup of tea and a bun. Presently, somebody came in and um, said, I've got a gig, it's a fortune, it's a pound each. And it was a top line band. It was, well, it was number two band, uh, fighting for the honours of being the number one band. It used to travel all over the country, and very rarely did I get home. And people were phoning up and asking me to do broadcasts with them, and so I thought, oh, I must be better than I think I am. And all of a sudden, after about four or five years of this, I thought, oh, I've had enough of this. I'm going to go back onto flying. So that was a bit hairy scary, flying at night. So you call them on the ground and say you're running into a storm and you're thinking they're going to alter course, not on your life. The reply was, Roger. And uh, you <laughs> yeah, had to go straight into it. <laughs> of course, you learn to live with that. Got up to about 800 feet and suddenly I got a runaway propeller. The speed of the propeller goes at a fast rate. And as a result, you've got a fire hazard on your hands. And I cut back all three other engines and climbed at minimum speed. I called the tower and they asked me some daft question like, do you want to do a complete full letdown? I said, no, I don't want I'm going to split last turn to get down on that runway pretty quick. They cleared the runway of all the aircraft while I was doing all this. So I did this split last turn, kept the speed back as much as possible and I got it on the runway without it catching fire. And was I relieved? I dropped it in the middle of the runway and left it there. Bloody thing can blow up. I had something like five engine failures in one week. But that's nothing. I mean, you lose an engine, you can cut that down, balance the aircraft, and you can go for doomsday. You're supposed to go back to your nearest base, but uh, I always get the aircraft back home. And uh, with no bothers at all. It never worries me, that sort of thing. So Ken returned once again to the skies, but this time instead of fighter planes, he was flying commercial airliners as a freelance pilot. For five years I was on the Australian run, and we were running rockets to Woomera. Didn't have any passengers, and that's nice then, you haven't got any complaints. Yeah. Anybody to shout at you or say, what happened to my cup of tea? One of the landings was, um, there were mountains, it started off in a ditch, and it went uphill, very abruptly uphill, for a short distance, and then levelled off. And that was the runway. It wasn't a runway, it was a grass strip. And suddenly it went up and over the top, and then there was a lake, 200 yards. And that was the amount of runway you got to use to land. You've got to land with your brakes on, which was true, really true. I mean, your brakes go on immediately before you touch down. You've got to do that to stop. And I used to say that. And they, everyone thought I was joking, but I wasn't. I wasn't joking. No, that's just what you had to do. Put the brakes on. This interview took place on the 26th of November in 2003. 2010, when Ken died, I knew that the funeral was coming up, so I took the footage from the video cassette and put it onto a DVD disc. It wasn't edited. It wasn't cut as you see it today, it was just, you know, in real time. It was about an hour's worth. We had the, the relatives and the family all gathered around the table, eating snacks, having a drink, remembering Ken, telling stories about the past, celebrating his life. And so I got my laptop out, I stuck the DVD into the side of the laptop, and I hit the play button. And, my goodness, you could have heard a pin drop. It was a really beautiful thing, but... It was spooky because it was like he'd come back. Ken was there in the room. Of course, everybody remembered all of these stories from Ken because he'd been telling them to everybody. He was a storyteller. 